Ahsoka is a triumphant return to form for Star Wars. In fact, it's the best Star Wars I've seen since Empire. Dave Filoni has well and truly saved the franchise with this show, and I can't wait to see what he does next. Those are the kinds of things I'd be saying if I was one of the room temperature IQ consumers on Twitter that have become so conditioned to the absolute mindless sludge being pumped onto Disney Plus that anything even marginally better is hailed as cinematic ambrosia. But the reality is that after two unnecessarily protracted episodes, I can say with a fair degree of confidence that Ahsoka isn't going to save Star Wars, Dave Filoni isn't a genius, and this show isn't a triumphant return to form. The truth is that for the most part it's just another mediocre Disney Star Wars show, only dressed up in slightly better clothes. The plot is another tedious series of fetch quests about the hunt for another MacGuffin that'll unlock another map that'll point the way to another missing legacy character in exile, another doomsday weapons being constructed by another bunch of Imperial wannabes, and it features another flat, uninteresting protagonist with all the personality and charisma of an unbuttered ham sandwich. And it's all held together by a heady combination of convenience, contrivance, and the sheer willpower of the writers. Even worse, it pretty much demands that you watch not one, but two animated Star Wars shows just to understand what the fuck is even happening. Because damn man, it certainly doesn't waste any time filling in the blanks for you, not when there's far more important things to do, like, uh, walking, and looking, and more walking. And straight away, you know this isn't going to be a show that's big on logic. The first episode kicks off with a former Imperial Loyalist named Morgan Elspeth. Oh, come on! <laughs> Wait, what? That's her name? That sounds about as Star Warsy as Angus McDougal. It's shy being Scottish! Anyway, whatever. So Morgan's a former ally of Grand Admiral Thrawn, who got captured by Ahsoka, and now she's on her way to stand trial for her crimes. But then, oh no, a shuttlecraft appears with an old Jedi clearance code and requests to come aboard, and the captain makes it clear that he doesn't believe the code's legit. Because really, how could it be? The Jedi vanished decades ago. So what does he do, you might ask? Does he put his ship on high alert? Does he call for fighter support? Does he open fire on the shuttlecraft? Does he ask more questions to verify who these people really are and why they're here? If your answer is that he lets them come aboard his ship without a fight and then goes down to confront them personally with a small, easily defeated security detail, then you'd be right. <laughs> You know, I've seen plenty of characters make dumb decisions before, but it's rare to see them openly acknowledge how stupid they're being, while also pretending that they're actually smart and one step ahead of their opponents. Truly, a character is only as smart as the person writing them. Anyway, so they all get killed by Ray Stevenson and his learning disabled apprentice, and then they free Morgan who turns out to be a witch. What the fuck did I just hear? Wait, what? There's witchcraft in Star Wars now? Yeah, sure, okay, why not? And she's looking for a secret map that'll lead her to Thrawn's location so she can bring him back and take control of the galaxy. Because there's always a fucking secret map and stuff like this. It's literally the only way we can move the plot forwards. Anyway, it turns out that Ahsoka is already way ahead of her, so she goes to some ancient temple thing and walks around extremely slowly until she figures out a Resident Evil style puzzle that reveals a generic mysterious movie prop that's actually the map. But then a bunch of battle droids show up and challenge her to a fight instead of, you know, shooting her. Because I'm pretty sure they could eventually overwhelm her with superior firepower, but whatever. She beats the shit out of most of them and the survivors activate a self-destruct device to try and take her out. But it's okay because they literally warn her that they're about to do it, and it takes about 15 minutes for them to actually detonate, so she's got plenty of time to run away. You know, I've got a question about this scene. Like, what's the point in any of this? These droids droids were sent here specifically to recover the map, of which there is only one copy, and if their self-destruct actually worked, then they would have completely vaporized it and Morgan's entire plan would have been ruined. So what exactly was the thinking here, guys? Did you literally just want a big explosion for the hero to run away from? Ah, whatever. So Ahsoka returns to the fleet and meets up with Hera, and the two of them stare at each other in silence for about 10 minutes before Hera explains that Morgan's escaped, and Ahsoka's like, nah, it'll be fine. Also, so the map's encrypted so they need some kind of expert to crack it, so naturally Ahsoka chooses to take it to graffiti artist Sabine Wren because this is a Dave Filoni show and Sabine Wren is a Dave Filoni character. 
together. Then there's more long and meaningful staring at each other, and honestly, I was this close to telling them to get a room and fuck so that they could get it over with. But eventually, Sabine takes the map and cracks the puzzle by literally turning two dials on the top until it matches a picture of the temple floor that it came from. SON OF A BITCH! <laughs> oh fuck off, show. Even a random chump like me could have figured that out pretty quickly. Shit man, you probably could have solved it just by randomly turning the dials on top until you hit the correct answer. Anyway, then developmentally challenged Sith Apprentice shows up and challenges Sabine to a lightsaber fight. So naturally she loses and gets impaled through the gut with a lightsaber and developmentally challenged Sith Apprentice escapes with the map. But it's okay though because by the next episode she's right as rain. BULLSHIT! You know, I'm old enough to remember when blades of superheated plasma energy actually caused serious and permanent damage to people. <laughs> now it's treated more like a casual inconvenience that you can bounce back from in a couple of hours. Either way, things are looking bad for our dynamic duo. They've got no leads, no map, and no idea what to do next. So Ahsoka goes back to Sabine's home even though she just came from there because it's the only way that Dave can get the plot moving again. And wouldn't you know it, a single droid got left behind to try to kill her. Why is it still there when they already recovered the map and accomplished their mission and Ahsoka's got no way of figuring out what they're gonna do next? Why doesn't it just self-destruct the moment she shows up for a guaranteed kill? Not a great plan. The point is that she quickly and easily beats it and slices its head off, and they're able to hack into its systems to discover where it was manufactured. Not who actually sent it, mind you, or where they were based, or what their plans might be, or what important conversations the droid might have been privy to, just where the thing was built. Wait, shouldn't this kind of information be automatically wiped when a droid goes into combat? Kind of like how soldiers don't go on missions behind enemy lines with their wallets and ID cards with them. And that magically brings them to a Republic shipyard just as the bad guys are in the middle of stealing a hyperdrive unit to power up their giant doomsday weapon. Wow, that was lucky. Lucky their search didn't bring them to some old factory that manufactured the droid like 10 years ago and has no idea what it's been used for since then. Lucky that they happened to show up in the crucial 5 minute window before the bad guys escaped with the hyperdrive. Lucky this absolute tool decided to announce his intentions before drawing a weapon on them. Writing is easy when everything's convenient, isn't it, Dave? And the episode ends with Morgan having the map and the hyperdrive, and Ahsoka and the others able to track her ship, and Sabine giving herself the world's shittiest haircut and deciding that she's ready to be a proper girl boss now. You know, assessing the relative merits of Ahsoka is a tricky one because I'm not really sure what I should be comparing it to. On the one hand, it's way better than plague rat infested bilge water like Boba Fett, Obi-Wan Kenobi or The Mandalorian Season 3, but it's nowhere near the mature and detailed storytelling of Andor. What it really is, is paint by numbers Disney Plus writing, where everything just kind of happens as and when the plot needs it to, and you're not meant to think too much about all the rules that the writers had to bend and break to get there. J.J. Abrams was a master at this kind of thing because he was able to hide it behind a relentless shitstorm of dumb action sequences, non-stop plot events and characters yelling things at each other so fast that you never had time to take it in. On the other hand though, Ahsoka is so fucking slow and ponderous that you've got nothing but time to think about all the stuff that doesn't make sense. For example, the first episode is almost an hour long and you feel every second of it. You could pretty easily cut 20 minutes of walking, staring and thinking out of this thing and lose nothing of value. Characters constantly revisit previous scenes and areas, reiterate conversations that already made their point perfectly well, and deliver their clunky dialogue like they're being paid by the second. It's frustrating because it feels like the show is actively trying to hold you up and waste your time. Brevity really is a virtue, Dave. The characters themselves are all bland as fuck and have got nothing even resembling personalities. Like, from what I remember about Rebels and the Clone Wars, characters like Hera, Sabine and Ahsoka had real sparkle and warmth to them. They expressed emotions freely, they had distinct outlooks and different approaches to things, they felt like real individual people with their own drives and motivations. Now it's like they all got cast from exactly the same mould, and that mould had a single word printed on it. STOIC. 
is literally the only trait that I could assign to any of them because they give absolutely nothing for the audience to grapple with. And it's not an issue with the actresses, that's for sure. Rosario Dawson and Mary Elizabeth Winstead are both excellent performers, so I can only assume this is what they were specifically asked to deliver. Honestly, what is it with Lucasfilm casting talented actresses and forcing them to play characters without an ounce of personality or charisma? There's a difference between being stoic about suffering and adversity and being a fucking block of wood that doesn't react to anything. Ray Stevenson plays the only significant male character in the show, and don't get me wrong, he's great while he's on screen, it's just that he doesn't seem to happen very often. Now, ultimately, I'd be lying if I said that Ahsoka was the worst Star Wars project I've ever seen, and if you're a big fan of the Clone Wars or Rebels, then you're probably going to get a kick out of seeing your favourite characters in live action, it's just that I don't think there's enough here to recommend it to anyone else. There's definitely a kernel of a good show lurking deep down inside, I just don't know if it's going to be able to fight its way through the lumbering pacing, contrived writing, flat performances, Dave Filoni's ego stroking and the Lucasfilm studio interference that's already starting to drag down the enjoyment. I'll stick with it for now, I guess, but considering how most Star Wars shows tend to drop off sharply after the first couple of episodes, I don't exactly have high hopes for Ahsoka. Anyway, that's all I've got for today. Go away now.